So I would like to welcome everybody on behalf of the Department of Geology, Geography and Environmental Studies to one of our uh, department seminars. Uh, my name is Deanna Van Dyke uh, and I'm a professor in the department. And I'm just very excited to be introducing one of my colleagues who's going to be uh, speaking to us this afternoon. Um, so Dr. Jamie Skillen, uh, has his Bachelor in Environmental Science from Wheaton College. He has a Master of Arts in Theology from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. And he has a PhD in Natural, Natural Resources Policy from Cornell University. And then he joined us at uh, Calvin College in 2008. And with a, a few years uh, teaching in and uh, directing uh, things at the Oregon Extension. Um, he has been uh, present with us and we're uh, very thrilled to have him uh, here. So he is an associate professor of environmental studies in our department and also the director of the Calvin Ecosystem Preserve and Native Gardens. Um, he does a lot of things. And so I will not try to uh, mention all of them here so that he can have a good amount of time to talk with us. Uh, but I do want to highlight a couple of books that he has uh, written. And so one book that you may find uh, interesting is The Nation's Largest Landlord, uh, The Borough of Land Management in the American West. And so he's going to be drawing from some of his uh, knowledge of those themes in his talk today. And uh, also he has a book on uh, federal ecosystem management, its rise, fall, and afterlife. And he has a more recent book that he's gonna be uh, drawing themes from in today's presentation. And so he will be, uh, he, he will be uh, introducing that, uh, that book. Um, so we're very thrilled to have Jamie talk with us this afternoon on uh, God, Guns and the 2020 election. And I will turn things over to uh, Dr. Skillen. Uh, let's welcome him and enjoy what he has to say. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's great to be here, wherever here is. Uh, I'm sorry that we're not together in person, but I am glad that this remote forum lets you all join. And I look forward to comments uh, and questions at the end. I'll share my screen here. And here we go. And I, you know, I feel badly because uh, really this is just the title slide. The imagery is not part of my talk, but I just want to let you soak that in for a minute. Holly Fisher in 2014 explaining that she is holding her first and second amendment rights. All right, so the talk I'm giving today is based on a new book, This Land is My Land, Rebellion in the West. Uh, in it, I trace three periods of conservative protest or rebellion focused on federal lands and these rebellions over the last 40 years. The Sagebrush Rebellion of 79 to 82, what's often called the War for the West of the 1990s, and then what I'm calling the Patriot Rebellion, which I thought it was over when I finished this book, but I would say it, it's ongoing. I thought about this project uh, first in 2014, and that's when militias stared down federal law enforcement officers so that a rancher named Cliven Bundy could continue grazing his cattle illegally on public lands. And more interesting to me, when mainstream conservatives like Sean Hannity rushed to the ranch to celebrate Bundy's actions. And as I began digging into it and other militia showdowns in the West, I found that I couldn't understand them without digging into the context of evolving conservative politics in the United States more broadly. Now, because we have a national election in just 11 days, uh, and I'm in Michigan and you're all over, I won't focus on the West. I wanna draw on the book's treatment of broader national politics. Now, since the book was finished, oops, uh, Black Lives Matter protests have swept the nation and right-wing militias have mobilized to help the police. COVID-19 has swept the country and with it growing conservative protests against health restrictions. The characters I wrote about in the book just have sprung back into the limelight. 
Ammon Bundy, pictured here, and son of the rancher I mentioned a moment ago, was arrested twice last month at the Idaho State Capitol for trespassing and interrupting a special legislative session. Bundy has likened the COVID restrictions to what Nazi Germany would do and says, if citizens don't stand, we are headed for another Holocaust. Now, I like this picture that you're seeing primarily because him being handcuffed in a comfortable office chair does seem to undercut some of his warning about the bloodthirsty and tyrannical government that is out to get him. But some of the militias I wrote about also have been mobilizing around the COVID-19 and they've come heavily armed, as you see in the picture on the left. They seem to me to be shouting at the government that they are prepared to kill and die to stop the tyranny of mask requirements. All right, that's unfair. I mean, they're saying they're prepared to kill and die to defend what they believe are their constitutional rights that are being violated. If you consider them extreme, uh, consider too that they have been spending their time at the state capitol, followed by other groups represented here on the right that include groups like the Michigan Freedom Fund or the Michigan Pastors Association. So I would see this as, in my mind, extreme on the left and mainstream. And you can kind of keep those images in your head. But one of the things I'm interested in is the way in which these two have merged. So there no longer is a clear distinction between mainstream and extreme. I interpret this, or I see this partly in U.S. Attorney General William Barr's recent, recent explanation that he said COVID-19 measures were the greatest infringement of civil liberties in American history with the exception of slavery. So COVID-19 restrictions, the single greatest infringement on civil liberties since slavery. And I thought, really? Uh, has the Attorney General of the United States not heard about Jim Crow laws or Japanese internment camps? That's what I mean by there's a way in which mainstream conservative America has made room for what I consider to be, or would have been considered 40 years ago, fairly extreme, both rhetoric and actions. Uh, now here in Michigan, I think the highlight for us has been making national room, national news because of another group called the Wolverine Watchmen. And members of this group were arrested recently for an alleged plot to kidnap our governor and try her on their own for alleged crimes against the constitution. That's extreme. But a nearby sheriff explained to Fox News that since the governor had overstepped her authority, a citizen's arrest might be lawful. That's odd to me. I consider sheriffs and law enforcement mainstream. So how did we get here? How did we get to the point where the militia movement and what I'll just I realize this is broad brushstrokes, but what I'll call just militant and contemptuous politics enter the conservative mainstream. And yes, I think uh, the left or progressive politics requires a critique. That's just not what I'm doing today. Now, I don't think I have a comprehensive answer for you, but in this work on this book, I think there are three key drivers, the sort of ideas or symbols that have made the milit militias mainstream. And I would call those God, guns, and fear. Or to be more precise, and you'll see my high-tech graphics here, uh, I think of these as American civil religion, which I'll define, an insurrectionist view of the Second Amendment, and a widely shared conservative paranoia. What I'm trying to show here with the slide is, I think these are additive over the last 40 years. And so even though I won't talk about them in fully sequentially, I think of, I'll pick up American civil religion starting around 1980. And then I look at the way in which a reinterpretation of the second amendment changes some of the dynamics. And then finally, where what I would think of as a clear paranoia, which moves from the fringes to the mainstream. So let me start with American civil religion. This is not a new phenomenon. Uh, this goes back to the Puritans. It builds on the Christian tradition using beliefs, symbols, and rituals that venerate the nation and provide a powerful sense of purpose and belonging. It is, of course, not an organized religion, but what I would think of as a functional religion. That is, it answers questions about ultimate meaning and identity. In conservative American civil religion, the United States is seen as God's chosen country, a city on a hill, and a light to the nations. 
Its origin myth says that godly people found North America and prayerfully built a righteous nation. They were subject to bondage under British tyranny, but by God's grace, they were given victory over their subjector. God also inspired the US Constitution, providing a guide to prosperity and freedom. But sadly, many Americans were tempted by the serpent of secularism, communism, or liberalism, and chose to return to bondage under an oppressive administrative state of their own making. But there's good news. Redemption is possible. If Americans would just renounce secularism and collectivism and rededicate themselves to the nation's founding principles and Judeo-Christian values, we could flourish again. The expression of civil religion I pick up in the book, uh, I think is solidified in the 1980s. That is civil religion's old, but there are different chapters. And it's solidified in the 80s with the new right in American politics. This was the conservative coalition that carried Ronald Reagan to the White House and gave Republicans control of the Senate for the first time in 26 years. The new right, this is what was significant, it integrated free market libertarians, business interests with religious and social conservatives. And they did have to negotiate significant differences in order to collaborate. Practically speaking, what held them together was a common enemy, the federal government, and a common goal, that is pruning the federal government back and restoring some earlier period of American greatness, whether that was before the liberal rights revolution, the New Deal, or Reconstruction. And President Reagan, who understood this coalition, summed up their growing resentment in his first inaugural address, when many of you may remember that he told the nation, government was not the solution to their problems, government was the problem. Now the new right was funded by business interests that were opposed to federal regulation. The country's free enterprise system, they argued, was under assault, threatening American freedom and prosperity. A liberal elite, they warned, had taken over government, the education system, the media, and other key institutions, and were working to undermine the nation's most sacred principles, individual freedom, limited government. Business interests fought back directly and this was a highly organized effort and a collective effort. And the number of corporate lobbyists increased from 175 to 2,500 from 1975 to 1982. The number of corporate political action committees increased from 200 to 1,200 just during the Carter administration. Business interests also funded a new infrastructure of conservative think tanks, foundations, and public interest law firms to carry their revival message to every part of American society. But it was conservative Christians that gave the new right its grassroots power. Like business interests, conservative Christians were alarmed by the federal government's growing power in their lives. When I say a they, it was a diverse group and they were angry about different things, but certainly that the government had, federal government had legalized abortion had restricted prayer in schools, had forced racial integration, had promoted women's rights. And they too waged a shock and awe campaign in the late 1970s and early 1980s that was organized primarily around uh, family values. And then that grew into family values and free market economics. So groups like Focus on the Family or Concerned Women for America were founded in that period, late 70s, early 80s. The coalition had a variety of ties, including the fact that certainly many West wealthy business people were themselves religious conservatives, and many conservative Christians saw free market capitalism as God's blueprint for American society. But even more importantly, I think, they shared rhetoric and symbols of American civil religion that bound them together and that continues to hold the conservative coalition represented by the Republican Party together today. In this civil religion, uh, the US Constitution served and serves as the sacred text. And within that, the first 10 amendments known as the Bill of Rights are like the 10 commandments that God gave to Moses. And just as Moses warned the Israelites about following God's law, the new right warned Americans that following the Bill of Rights was the path to life and ceding those rights to government was the path of death. And by their estimation, the nation had clearly rejected or trampled the amendments. Leaders of the new right argued that judicial decisions limiting prayers in schools, 
and other forms of religious expression violated the plain meaning of the First Amendment and its right to free speech and assembly. Restrictive gun legislation clearly trampled the Second Amendment right to bear arms. Environmental and business regulations functionally nullified the Fifth Amendment's protection of private property and due process. And certainly the judicial rulings overturning state bans on abortion and forcing public school integration gutted the 10th Amendment. The new right called on Americans to repent of these sins, to turn back to conservative readings of the Constitution and conservative Judeo-Christian values. Now, there is of course here an important hermeneutical question. After all, competing interpretations of the Constitution are what divide us, not the Constitution itself. And as I listen to the popular conservative rhetoric of the last 40 years, I'm struck by dual commitments to constitutional originalism and constitutional fundamentalism. And let me define those, uh, they're not self-evident. Originalism is the conviction that the Constitution must be interpreted according to the intent of its authors according to what it would have meant at the time. The late Supreme Court Justice Antony Scalia held this philosophy and one of his protégés, Amy Coney Barrett, will most likely be confirmed as a Supreme Court Justice on Monday and she'll uh, bring that to the court. But notice both justices are committed to the work, the very real work it takes to interpret the constitution and to do so through a particular lens. What's interesting to me is the way that this has been merged with what I think of as a fundamentalist view of the Constitution, in which in popular language, people argue that the meaning is self-evident. It requires no interpretation. And as far as I can tell, the obvious tension here is resolved simply by assuming that the Constitution's self-evident meaning is only clear to true Americans or true patriots. So you have to return to the founding fathers' values and ideas, and through them, you too will be able to see the obvious meaning of the Constitution. Now, the conservative coalition of the new right has evolved since the 1980s. But in popular rhetoric, I hear the same civil religious uh, language and symbols. And I think that still holds it together. In the Reagan uh, Republican Revolution of 1994, some of you remember, Republicans took control of the House of Representatives. Their agenda, which they called the Contract with America, wasn't just a policy platform. It was intended to repristinate the nation. House Majority Leader Dick Armey argued that the contract was, quote, a freedom revolution, a revolution not so much in power as in faith, the faith of our fathers. When the Tea Party erupted in 2009, so moving near the present, the civil religious rant language was ubiquitous. Tea Party rallies, as I saw them, were like revival services, where people alternated between prayer and pledge, the Pledge of Allegiance so often, it wasn't clear which one was more important. In the, and by the way, I'm not questioning whether they were sincere in either of those. Uh, I'm interested in the way that those two merged together. And so I should have mentioned earlier the image I put up here, the painting where it's Jesus holding the constitution. I mean, that's, that's what binds us together because we are God's people. Uh, I think that probably no one expressed this better than a Fox News host, Glenn Beck. Uh, from 2009 to 2011 on the Glenn Beck show, he offered tearful eulogies for the constitution. She said was God's blueprint for society. He wept for America, literally which had been all but destroyed, he said, by communists, socialists, fascists, secularists, and progressives. And he begged Americans to return to God and country and defend them both from attack. And today I'm struck by how often some conservative Christians seem to me to conflate God and country, church and nation. Uh, perhaps you remember Vice President Pence's speech at the Republican National Convention when he paraphrased Hebrews 12, we paraphrased a passage out of the Bible and simply replaced the name Jesus, which is important in Christianity, with the American flag. Quote, so let's run the race marked out for us. Let's fix our eyes on old glory and all she represents. Even many conservative Christians thought that had gone a little too far. And I would argue that President Trump won a surprise victory in 2016 precisely because he could manipulate the symbols and rituals of conservative civil religion so adeptly. 
Trump could show that he was prepared to fight for God's nation. What made him different from previous presidents is that he didn't express an obvious commitment to Jesus or God or Christian faith himself. Now, I know a number of Christians disagree with me on that, but you'd be hard pressed to find that uh, in Trump's uh, speeches and language. Uh, in my estimation, uh, many conservative Christians have confused civil religion with genuine Christian religion. I, I don't mean consciously confuse them. I mean that the two have merged in ways that I think are difficult to separate. Just think about what former Minnesota Representative Michelle Bachman said of Trump. And I quote her, we will in all likelihood never see a more godly biblical president in our lifetimes. And what was her evidence of that? It was the fact that Trump, President Trump had proposed a ban on transgender people serving in the military. What she wanted was someone who was strong, who was tough, who would fight for what she saw as traditional American values. Uh, she didn't care that President Trump certainly did not live up to the personal integrity, uh, moral integrity, that most Christians say is important. My favorite, though, of the election season was probably when Baptist pastor Robert Jeffress was asked if, if he wouldn't really want a godly president, you know, one like Jesus. And he replied, quote, government has to be a strong man to protect its citizens from evildoers. I want the meanest, toughest, son of a you know what I can find, and I believe that's biblical. Making America great again for many Americans and for some Christians seems to be all one has to do to demonstrate fealty to God. And that civil religion, which that treatment's all too brief, I'm happy to uh, discuss it further, but that helps explain how militias and militant rhetoric have become mainstream in conservative America. Because it not only provides symbols that unify a particular coalition, it assures them and assures their members that God is on their side, that their cause is righteous, and that their opponents aren't just wrong, that their opponents are a threat and evil. Now, I'll move on to this. Oh, wait, I sorry, I forgot I had these pictures, but you just, you just have to take those in. Trump leading the Crusades, uh, clearly Jesus uh, coaching Trump through the presidency. I'll move on to the Second Amendment and a particular interpretation of it. Uh, you'll notice I haven't mentioned militias yet or didn't mention them when describing the new right in the 1980. The reason is that because militias 40 years ago, and by this I mean the sort of self-proclaimed uh, disorganized or informal militias were primarily groups of white supremacists interested not in reforming government or culture, but in breaking free from it and founding new Aryan utopias. If you just look up Christian identity movement or the posse comitatus, you'll get a sense of this. For the militias and the conservative mainstream to embrace, uh, this wasn't going to work. Militias needed to rebrand themselves around mainstream civil religious symbols, and conservatives needed to be able to speak a more militant language. Enter the Second Amendment. The amendment itself states, quote, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. In the late 20th century, the courts interpreted this within the broader uh, text of the Second Amendment and said that it really protected people's right to keep and bear arms in the context of formal militia service. At the time it was written, that ensured that people had arms should the government call them up for service. But increasingly, and particularly in the 1980s, conservatives and the gun lobby, like the National Rifle Association, reinterpreted the Second Amendment in two critical respects. First, which you probably know, uh, they interpreted it to mean that the Second Amendment protected the individual right to keep and bear arms, regardless of any connection to militia service. And depends on who you talk to, uh, but it's often interpreted to mean an almost unlimited right in terms of what guns you should be able to own. Second, and far more importantly, uh, they argued that the Founding Fathers wrote the Second Amendment's protection first and foremost so that individuals would have weapons to defend themselves against the government. They constantly invoked the American Revolution, celebrating the fact that an armed citizenry was able to throw off the shackles of British rule. 
Wayne LaPierre of the National Rifle Association would say, when governments fear the people, there is liberty. When the people fear government, there is tyranny. The strongest reason for the people to keep arms is as a last resort to protect themselves against tyranny in government. So when I say an insurrectionist interpretation of the Second Amendment, I mean interpreting it to mean that my right to keep and bear arms is for the purpose of needing to rise up against my government when it becomes tyrannical. Uh, this, though it had been circulating, this really gained popular traction in the early 1990s in response to government action. I'll tell just a couple stories because these are the stories that you will hear over and over and over again um, to this day when you hear people talking about gun rights. The first event was a deadly FBI raid on the home of Randy Weaver in Ruby Ridge, Idaho. Weaver, who was a white separatist and lived with his family in the mountains, kept to himself. He was arrested on very modest charges of selling two sawed-off shotguns, which were prohibited by law, to undercover federal agents. When he failed to appear in court for a criminal hearing, the situation escalated. The U.S. Marshals obtained a new arrest warrant and spent the next two years surveilling the Weavers. In the summer of 1992, U.S. Marshals were walking on the Weaver's property when a, the family dog, Stryker, discovered them and raised the alarm. One of the Marshals shot Stryker, and Weaver's son, Sammy, returned fire at the Marshals. After an exchange of gunfire, Stryker, the dog, Sammy, Weaver's son, and a U.S. Marshal were dead. The FBI, U.S. Marshals, and other law enforcement quickly surrounded the Weaver's cabin, and the National Guard was called in to maintain a perimeter uh, around it. Inexplicably, the FBI snipers brought in were instructed to shoot all armed males outside the cabin, which is what they did. An FBI sniper shot and wounded Weaver. He then shot one of Weaver's friends. The bullet passed through him, passed through a door to the cabin, struck and killed Weaver's wife, Vicki, as she stood holding their 10-month-old baby. After an investigation and litigation, the Weavers were acquitted and were awarded $3.2 million in civil damages. The government, though it accounted uh, it, in its report, identified a number of errors or missteps, described this as a tragedy. But the militias insisted that Sammy and Vicki were assassinated by a rogue government that didn't want have Americans to have guns. And it demonstrated that they would kill you uh, if you crossed them on the Second Amendment. And just a year later, federal agents attempted to serve an arrest warrant for David Koresh at his uh, compound, the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas. Uh, the arrest warrant was for gun charges. When dozens of agents stormed the Branch Davidian compound, they were met with heavy gunfire. And in the end, four agents and 76 Branch Davidians died, men, women, and children. The federal government once again identified errors uh, in the arrest attempt, uh, but called it a tragedy. But increasing number of those on the right identified this as a military style attack, a mass murder of American system, citizens and over what? Over gun possession. Tensions escalated just the next year. And this is the third key thing. When President Clinton signed the Brady Act into law, it mandated background checks for all handgun purchases. And if you don't know the Brady Act, it was passed in response to the assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan uh, in the 80s. But the gun rights lobby and those on the far right sounded the alarm. It was always a slippery slope argument. The government they insisted was planning to disarm Americans so that they couldn't defend themselves from government violence. And anyone who opposed these measures would surely face a ruby ridge of their own. By 1995, an estimated 100,000 people had joined militias throughout the country. And the animating question was the Second Amendment. What's also important is that these new recruits were not the earlier generation of just straight up white supremacists and anarchists. They included mainstream conservatives who felt that organizing and showing the government how serious they were was necessary to keep the government in check. 
Now, if I had more time, I'd talk, continue talking about racism and the malicious, because that's certainly a thread that has continued to run through the movement. Uh, it's just been sublimated uh, by other, in other issues. Uh, and I would say that the malicious focus on gun rights um, has also, and particularly this idea of open carrying rifles and handguns, it is related to a demonstration of white power, but that's a different talk. The insurrectionist gun rights interpretation was ubiquitous on the right by the mid 1990s. And I need to add a quick sidebar here that isn't about one of my main ideas. It's to note that technology is a factor. In the 1980s, you had print media and network news. By the mid 1990s, you had cable news channels and internet, the early internet, which provided new tools for building ideological networks. But back to the Second Amendment. Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich wrote, the Second Amendment is a political right written into our constitution for the purpose of protecting individual citizens from their own government. Or I prefer what one of my favorite ranchers in the book said when asked about uh, the Second Amendment and his ranch. Quote, the founding fathers gave the individual a gun to fight the tyranny of government. What's that mean? The bearer can kill someone in the government if the reason is justified. I told the government, you take my cows, I will kill you as mandated by the Second Amendment. I don't need to tell you that this interpretation, which isn't the only interpretation, is alive and well today. Remember the standoff I mentioned at the outset, the one in 2014? One of my favorite characters in the book is a former Arizona sheriff named Richard Mack and he helped lead the standoff at the Bundy Ranch. He later told Fox News that during the standoff, he was, and I quote, actually strategizing to put all the women up at the front. If they were gonna start shooting, it's going to be women that are going to be seen televised all across the world getting shot by these rogue federal officers. I would have put my own wife or daughters there and I would have been screaming bloody murder to watch them die. I mean, he seems like a great dad. Anyway, uh, Mac gained national recognition in the 90s for filing a lawsuit against the Brady Act. The National Rifle Association funded it, and he won. And his argument is that requiring sheriffs to enforce it, there was a particular provision, was an unfunded mandate. With that fame, he became uh, a prominent gun rights advocate in his own right. He wrote the foreword to the book about the Weavers, entitled, Vicky, Sam, and America, how the government killed all three. He also wrote a book entitled From My Cold Dead Fingers, Why America Needs Guns. But most importantly, he founded something called the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association. And he travels the country telling sheriffs that they should ignore any federal or state law they personally believe is unconstitutional. The most frequent laws they cite are gun laws. So when you read about a county sheriff refusing to enforce gun laws in Michigan, in Washington, anywhere in the country, or to enforce COVID-19 measures, they probably have been influenced by Mac and his own fundamentalist reading of the Constitution. All right, but why is this reinterpretation of the Second Amendment important? I think it created a bridge between the extremists on the far right and the mainstream conservatives by giving them common cause. It allowed the militias that had once been far-right, white supremacists, tax dodgers, uh, sort of outlaws, it gave them a cause in the mainstream to fight for, the guns that were so important. Uh, Americans have always loved guns, but I would say that what's happened over the last 40 years is that guns have increasingly become one of the three main symbols of conservative civil religion and patriotism. Just look at the picture I started with of the woman holding uh, a gun, a Bible, and the, the flag behind her. Uh, and in fact, I sometimes think guns have become more the most important symbol of conservative patriotism because, as the MR NRA reminds us, the Second Amendment protects all the others. All right, but the third step, because the militias were still on the fringes, I would say, of the conservative uh, co coalition and conservative politics. Uh, so the mainstream conservatives, well, sorry. So they, this did bring the militias to the, I would say the outer chambers 
of the mainstream. But they, they stayed there. There wasn't room for them. And the main reason I would argue, the only thing holding them back or keeping them separate was the depth of the militia's paranoia that the mainstream at the time still considered fringe. In the mainstream in the 1990s, people were getting their news from Fox, from conservative radio, from print material, which did filter out the most extreme and baseless conspiracy theories. The militias had their own communication networks, uh, ham radios, print material, personal gatherings, and they were in the shadows. And what they were saying, or the paranoia they had, was profound. I was struck by this when I read a congressional hearing on the militias from 1995, right after the Oklahoma City bombing. Even Republicans who had invited militia leaders to testify and who thanked them for their patriotism and who praised the militias for protecting Americans were incredulous with what they heard. Here are just a couple examples. Sam Sherwood of the United States Militia Association warned in a congressional hearing, quote, Bill Clinton is bringing up 100,000 Hong Kong Chinese to America to be his federal police. Bill Clinton is planning to see, seize every gun in America with his Chinese police. John Trotchman, founder of the militia of Montana roared, a government which turns its tanks on its own people, referring to the Waco incident, has a taste for blood. We are on the brink of invasion, surrender, annihilation, and population reduction. Plans are now about to swing into high gear. Who of you will be left alive unmutilated? Robert Fletcher, also with the militia of Montana, warned that the U.S. Army and, the, and FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Administration, were building internment camps, concentration camps in the United States into which they would put citizens once they had disarmed them. Uh, and since I'm here in Michigan, I'd be remiss not to mention Norm Olson, who founded uh, in militia circles, the well-regarded Michigan militia. He warned in 1995 that a civil war was about to start because of government corruption and overreach. Here's what he told the members of Congress. You have made yourselves the enemy of the people. You have to fix this. Time is running out. Do not attempt to cause a national emergency to throw the country into martial law. We expect that you may try, but we've planned for such an event and have adjusted for it. Again, this idea that the federal government, and it goes on, uh, there was Agenda 21, if you've heard that. It was the fear that the United States in one world order was going to cede national sovereignty to the United Nations or to Russia, uh, that we would all be imprisoned, that our lives were in danger. And for mainstream Republicans, this really was too far. Now, this brings me to the present. I think the militia movement we see today, along with the militant and destructive politics on the right, couldn't have happened. It couldn't have been brought into the center or into the full mainstream of conservative politics until enough people, not everyone, certainly not everyone, but enough people shared the paranoia about government plots, satanic liberals, and the United Nations that had differentiated the militias. And I can't imagine this could have happened without the rise of social media, which is both a true free market for information and truth. And it's also driven by algorithms that reinforce your pre-existing beliefs. So over the last decade, baseless paranoia has gone mainstream. And keep in mind, um, there are plenty of conservatives who don't share that. Uh, but again, the militias don't need all of us. They just needed enough. And now we live in a world where baseless and terrifying conspiracy theories flood our screens every day. And they aren't all coming from the fringes. I add, this is not limited to conservatives, which I'm focusing on. This is just the air we all breathe. Just think for a moment about the QAnon conspiracy. If you in 1995 had said that the Democratic Party was run by a cabal of pedophiles, or I could come up with any of the other conspiracies, um, you would have been seen as crazy. And I hope all of you can see that that particular conspiracy theory is baseless and it is destructive. Yet we right now have Republican candidates running for Congress who openly trumpet QAnon. We have a president who retweets QAnon conspiracies. So it's not that everyone needs to believe it. It's just that that needs to be validated. 
And here's the tragedy of it. Oh, I have a timer on my light. Hang on. There we go. Uh, here's the tragedy of it. Uh, I'm reasonably confident that most conservative leaders, even the ones who peddle QAnon, don't actually believe it. I don't think that Trump believes it. They're using QAnon as a sign or symbol to remind their supporters that their opponents are evil and that they are on the side of good. Uh, it's not unlike the way within the militias you will constantly hear references to, uh, and this is not a crazy conspiracy theory, you will constantly hear uh, references to the American Revolution, to World War II and overthrowing Nazi Germany. It is a reminder to people that the stakes are high. The symbol here is you're on the right side, pedophiles are on the other side. But you know, the tragedy is, though that gives politicians power, it's a Faustian bargain. You cannot lean on civil religious conviction, ask people to arm themselves for battle, tell people that the government is coming for their children, and then act somehow surprised by violence and aggression. And I want to be clear. Uh, I'm not drawing any kind of direct causal link. I am not saying, and my wife hates when I use double negatives like this, I'm not saying that President Trump's tweets made the, the Wolverine watchman try to plot to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer. It's not what I'm suggesting at all. All I'm suggesting is that when you promote that environment, you create an environment that is indeed dangerous. Uh, and I'm reminded, I keep going back to this, I'm reminded of something I read during another militia showdown uh, when a group of people occupied the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge in 2016. A great reporter, Hal Herring, watched militia members patrolling the refuge grounds, pledging their lives to the constitution and talking about black helicopters and secret FEMA prisons. This is what he wrote. It was clear to me that someone would die. Such certitude as these men and women possess demands blood sacrifice to justify itself. There were too many armed people in and circling the occupation with too many varying levels of sanity and too many varying motivations for being there. Guns, for as long as we have had them, have given undue impetus to arguments that lack merit or reason, have given credence to delusional rants. But these first two lines, it was clear to me that somebody would die, and someone did die, such certitude as these men and women possess demands blood sacrifice to justify itself. I think that Howe could just as well have written this about our broader political moment. So I want to move here in the end to something I'm, I don't normally do in giving a, um, a research back talk. I wanna move from description to exhortation because unlike many of the things I've written on the mining law of 1872, um, I'm talking about something that affects your lives. So I'll take off my academic hat, I'll put on my citizen cap and say just 30 seconds. As we look to the national election in 11 days and to the trauma that I suspect will follow no matter who wins, uh, we need collectively to say we have now hit bottom. We need collectively to say there is a better way to do politics. Here are just modest steps. I won't fix this, you won't fix this, but here is my advice drawing on the talk I gave. First, say no to paranoia that gets clicks and votes and reject the utterly dehumanizing descriptions of the people with whom you disagree. Own guns if you wish, by all means, it is a protected constitutional right but don't wave them constantly as if to suggest guns are the best tools for sustaining a democratic republic. Honor the United States, absolutely. Uh, the United States is a remarkable nation. I say that sort of hesitantly because it has too many overtones, but I'm proud to live in the United States. Honor the nation, but also be willing to take a hard look at its brokenness. I, I won't, Mm, I won't add opinion here. Uh, it is a nation state. It is not God's chosen people. So that's it. That's how I've solved the problem that I tried historically to explain. Uh, now, I don't want to end on a hopeless note. So let me stop with just one tiny glimmer of hope, a little light 
that's happened just this last week. And seriously, I think about this every day uh, to, to gain comfort. Several days ago, I don't know if you saw this in the news, the Democratic and Republican gubernatorial candidates in Utah did something I had never seen before. They distributed a joint campaign ad. The ad didn't promote one candidate over the other. So in that sense, it wasn't a very effective campaign ad. Rather the two, and it's a remarkable shot, they're standing at a considerable distance from one another with a blank white background. One has a red tie, one has a blue tie. Uh, sorry, I forgot my other slide. Here we go. Uh, they're standing at a distance. Their message is uh, that they, we can disagree without hating each other. The campaign ad was a campaign for civility. And they told the people of Utah, oops, that it was possible to have a different political rhetoric uh, and that Utah could be a model. I was so moved that I decided to vote for both of them. And I'm now gonna see if it's legal. Thank you. And uh, I look forward to your questions and any comments uh, that you have. So thank you very much, uh, Jamie, for that uh, talk. And I'm sure you can imagine the uh, wild applause that's going on in about 80 different rooms right now. Um, we have some time for questions. And because we do have a lot of people in on uh, this seminar, I would invite you to put your questions into the chat. If you're new to Zoom, you can uh, find that near the bottom of your screen under more. Um, and if we have some uh, questions that will appear there, uh, we'll take those. Um, I'm afraid that Jamie has already answered my most immediate question, which was, uh, what do you see as a way forward? Um, but maybe while we're waiting for uh, more questions to appear, maybe Jamie, I'll ask you to, um, do you see other ways uh, forward also? I really appreciated your glimmer of, of hope at the end. Um, and then, uh, um, and then we've got a, a different type of question that's coming up in the in the chat. So I'm asking about uh, glimmers of hope. And we also have a question in the chat. Can you speak a little bit more on how President Trump has influenced the rise of the militias? Sure. Uh, I mean, I'll say, I could say a number of things about hope. I think that, uh, and this is true of many, many social problems, right? It has to have not one solution. It has to have, you know, multiple centers uh, that organize uh, to produce change. And one of the things that I find hopeful, this doesn't answer your question about the way forward, but I do take real hope when I look back and think about some of the unbelievably difficult things from which the United States and Americans have recovered. That's one of the places in which I take hope. We had a civil war. Um, I think even of public health things like smoking, where no one would have thought 50 years ago that we could just convince Americans to all stop smoking. Uh, I put climate change in the same bucket. I don't see a path forward, but I also know that like civil rights, uh, you know, like uh, some recovery after World War II, it's possible. Uh, and the most difficult thing to gain back is hope. Um, that's it for my solving the problem. But this okay. is where I say, I'm, I, do, I do historical work. Uh, so the question about Trump, I mean, Trump is, it, it is difficult, it's challenging. What I would say is that uh, President Trump uh, is not, did not create the problem we have by any means. What President Trump did was he embodies one of the really challenging problems that we're facing. And so President Trump has through all kinds of symbols has signaled to people who were on, certainly we're on the, the far, the fringes, we're in the shadows in the 1990s or even the aughts, sim signaled to them that there is room for them in the mainstream, that they will not be criticized or judged, at least not by him, um, for views and actions that are horrific. I mean, I, I won't go through a litany because I don't wanna, 
I don't want to issue a litany on Trump, but I think at every level. So Trump, um, we have civil religion, but in fact, without statements of actual religious faith. Um, we have his uh, position on gun rights. We have, but even more than that, I mean, President Trump revels in baseless conspiracy theory, in spreading information that is patently false. And then when called on it, either ignores it or simply says, well, you know, he was joking. I mean, he was joking about that. Um, and what's sad to me about it is his inability to take any responsibility at all for some of the things that he might not have caused, but the kinds of things that he is at least enabling. And I do think that when, uh, I mean, I, I do think about this, if, if President Trump wins another four years in office, I do wonder sort of what's the next step. Um, so I'm sorry, my answer isn't very eloquent, but it's, I'm, I'm speaking through a filter. Um, but, but I would cert, what I would say then to sum it up is simply that President Trump didn't cause this, but tre President Trump is validating the problem I'm describing at every turn. And that itself is increasing the problem. Well, th thank you for that answer. And we thank Neil for that question. We have a question in the chat from Samir uh, who asks, have you looked at why militia groups isolate themselves from urban areas or is that a stereotype and militia groups have no geographic isolation? I'm just, I'm thinking through the data that I have I couldn't give you an answer on the distribution of militias. Uh, it does seem likely to me that the organized militias or all the organized militias I've seen are not headquartered in urban areas, right? It might be suburban or further out. Uh, and part of that is the privacy. Part of that is concern about government. Part of it is just where they wanna live. But it, it does tie into other demographics. So the militia movement is overwhelmingly white. Um, it, the militia movement is overwhelmingly conservative. So if we look at uh, a political map and we look at demographics, um, it's not hard to see why those two might map onto one another. And the point I made earlier about uh, questions of racism and white power it is really important to recognize that there is a difference when a white man carries a gun and when a black man carries a gun in the United States. There are a couple black militias. There are plenty of African Americans and other black Americans who carry guns, but there is a statement being made by the militias. When you have a rifle, you have a handgun, it is saying not only that I wanna protect my rights, it is saying I am the one with power and I will use violent means to protect that power. Uh, and so that doesn't answer your question about geographic distribution, but it, it does get to some of those, um, but it's related, I would say. Thank you. Um, then we have a, a question, um, kind of nicely following along on some themes here, a question from Joseph Taylor. Um, and the question is about the role of non-social media. Uh, it strikes me that as with the current moment of extreme forms of protests, the media seems to have amplified the extreme visions of federal lands in your larger research subject. Is that right? And if so, how do we as scholars direct attention away from the noisy sensation? Well, uh, thanks for your uh, question, Jay, and thanks, thanks for tuning in. Uh, it is a problem, and it is a problem in part because of the way in which even you know cable news uh, is in a marketplace and needs to draw attention. Uh, and it's also because when I think the media is looking for a story, or if you think about a photographer looking for an image, what they're looking at is they're trying to find a symbol, something that symbolizes what they're interpreting in front of you. So if you look back at coverage of the Bundy Ranch standoff in 2014, uh, if you look through the footage, what you'll see is that there were hundreds and hundreds of people who were not armed, um, riding horses, waving flags, singing songs, 
there were also hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of um, heavily armed people in tactical gear. But then if you go back and look at what are the images that made it onto the news? Probably the most popular was an image of someone in a tactical position, a sniper position on an overpass pointing his rifle at law enforcement. By the way, that guy right now is running for a state house in Idaho, I think. Anyway, um, so I think part of that problem is there is a natural tendency to say the nature of this story, what this story is really about is an armed militia standing off against or standing against, um, you know, law and order. One of the ways that I think we can counter this in our work, whether it's scholarship, the way we talk is one is to just ask ourselves the question, uh, are we privileging those extremes? But I think another way is through stories. Uh, I think of Liesl Carr Childer's book, uh, The Size of the Risk. And what she does in that book, even though she's offering a kind of historical critique, she's also letting people of different perspectives speak. And so what you get through that is really a much richer and more textured understanding of the issues. The problem with that is that it takes time. Um, and I want to add just two more things. The first is what I think, uh, particularly in scholarship, I think the goal ought to be what one geographer called critical empathy. That I think first and foremost, it's to make the effort of entering into the subject and just asking yourself, how is it that this world makes sense to Clive and Bundy? Um, I think that is uh, an important sort of caution and protection. But the second thing is simply, you know, I don't know that we can escape uh, Twitter analysis, even Twitter history. If you're limited in characters, um, it's really hard to provide a rich account of things and not simply grasp for uh, symbols or grasp for something that will get attention. Uh, I mean, I always think of in federal land management and probably a couple of former students have heard me say this, you know, you've see, all seen the bumper stickers um, but with Smokey the bear, right? Stop forest fires. Well, of course, if Smokey could talk to you, Smokey would sit down and say, well, you wanna stop some forest fires. You know, the wrong ones, when the weather conditions are bad, too much fuel is built up, wrong time of year, uh, we want certain fires. Well, Smokey doesn't have the ability to say that in a bumper sticker. So that doesn't answer your question. It just echoes your frustration. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll note that we are at the end of our regular seminar time, but we've got lots of great questions coming up in the chat. And one of the nice things about virtual seminars is that if you have to leave, you can just disappear. Um, so I'm going to keep on asking Jamie a few questions uh, from the chat um, until Jamie gives up on me uh, here. Um, can I, well, can I pick one? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I know that um, Jan Van Koten, although I think that was Jerry who's on, um, he said the word discernment has a long history at Calvin, Calvin University, where I teach, but seems to have been forgotten by many these days. It goes to the issue of some people will believe what is in their interest to believe. What do you think? Um, and there are two points of that. One is I am really concerned about the fact that our sources of information uh, all confirm our bias. So even if you want to find different perspectives, even if you want to dig into an issue so that you have more discernment, the minute you open Google, Bing, whatever, I mean, the algorithms are designed to return to you what you're interested in. And so I think that there are more and more obstacles to trying to look at something from different sides. Um, and I want to just give a, a shout out to Calvin on this. I actually think, you know, if you're not, um, if you don't know Calvin University, it's a Christian university. Um, and, you know, we have about 3,500 students. And one of the things that I think is a great testimony to Calvin's history, its culture, is the fact that at the university, uh, its Christian identity is not tied to party politics. 
So in fact, it's just politically, even though the, the people at Calvin are somewhat homogenous in terms of, certainly in terms of religious identity, um, that doesn't end up leading to a political homogeneity. And, but when I think about the work that it takes, even within this context, to have a good disagreement, uh, it's encouraging to have those disagreements. It's discouraging how hard that is to do. Thank you, Jamie. Do you want to choose another question from the chat? Oh, no, it's okay. I, I defer to you. I just saw that one and thought um, I should probably, I mean, I should probably give at least some advertisement for Calvin University. Okay. I don't know who all is out there, but if you're a senior in high school or a junior, um, come and join us. Okay. We're uh, civil. We have a, a question then. Why do you suppose women are not attracted to militias? Are militias an expression of male supremacy, hypermasculine toxicity? Oh, if you want to read just some really great gender studies stuff, um, just track down, I'm forgetting the author's name now, but there were a few people who wrote about this beautifully during the Malheur uh, standoff, the Malheur National Wildlife standoff. And, you know, I, unfortunately, I just don't, I don't feel equipped to offer that kind of analysis. Not because I don't think it's important, but I think I would do it poorly. Um, that won't stop me. Uh, so the one thing I'll say, though, is the militias, and this is just one piece of it, but the militia movement, which is a conservative movement, by conservative here, I, I mean that generically, it is about conserving something we have or restoring something that was lost. And if what you're doing is saying, we had, the, we had things right 60 years ago or 100 years ago, uh, you are reaching back to a variety of symbols of that earlier time. And so if you, I'm not saying I, I can read people's minds or know exactly what militia members think about gender, but you are reaching back to some very conservative or older ideas of gender roles. And so that's a piece of it. I also think that, yeah, the irresponsible analysis I'll give is, boy, it is a bunch of guys who want to have guns and feel powerful. Um, I think one of the, the great uh, difficulties is, you know, feeling powerless. Uh, when we feel powerless, we don't make our best decisions. Uh, and I think that, you know, I want to say most militia members, I don't think they're out there hoping they kill people. They're not actually looking for a gunfight. Um, it is showing the guns, showing how tough you are, that you would kill and die for it. And then it also is important because you're saying, I would kill and die for my children, for my wife. I mean, there is that kind of protector uh, identity that's important. That's about the best I can do. Okay. Uh, we thank uh, Judy for that question. And it seems to follow from the last things that you said that a question that Nathaniel has asked um, which is what effect did the deadly 2017 Charlottesville Unite the Right rally have on militia members and their ideologies? Um, did they approve of the harm that was caused by a white supremacist who rammed his car into a group of counter protesters? That seems to uh, follow nicely from some of the last things that you just said in your last answer. Yeah. Uh, I'll say that one, one of the things that has surprised me about uh, the period of the Trump administration, uh, both the run for office and Trump in office, is that it has really shown me how many of my assumptions were wrong. And what I mean by that is in the circles in which I run, uh, explicit racism, even if you, th if you think that, you would never say it. In other words, I thought we had moved to a point where there was a social approbation that would control at least our expressions that were demeaning, that were, um, you know, hateful. And I, I really was just surprised at how quickly and how easily the entire country has erupted with a kind of ugliness and hatred that I knew was there, but I, I didn't think that we'd be able to say it. 
Um, I think what we saw in Charlottesville and, and the president's own sort of, you know, hey, there are very good people on both sides of it. Uh, oh, absolutely. I mean, this is the president of the United States saying, hey, look, we can't judge between white supremacists uh, and non-white supremacists. They're all people. So I think the president has, has had a measurable uh, impact in encouraging uh, expressions of hatred and violence and has therefore encouraged violence itself. I, I just don't see any other way to make sense of the actions that are happening and the president's response. And that frankly is deeply concerning to me about another four years uh, of the Trump administration. In fact, I think if you look at the number of Republican, I mean, really Republican leaders, or at least I would say, um, you know, recognized Republicans and conservatives who say they're voting for Biden. I mean, everyone that I've heard, particularly if you look at the military people who have sort of defected, if you look at intelligence who have defected, you know, most of them that I've heard have said, look, I disagree with most of Biden's policies, but you know what? What we're choosing here is not about better or worse policies. We're talking about whether or not we have a president who will uphold the rule of law um, and who will sort of allow the nation to function. I mean, I really do think that they are terrified of another four years of Trump. And then uh, we'll, we'll go to our last question, which comes from Benji. And actually there's a few questions in here, so you can uh, choose what to answer out of here. Um, do social media outlets have the responsibility to regulate fake news and extreme movements that use their platforms? Should government have a foot in the door or a say in what should be posted? Um, the idea of government or, co or cooperate uh, businesses deciding what the public see, sees seems to flirt with inter, interfering with public rights. My initial response is I'm really glad that I don't work for Twitter or Facebook, um, you know, or YouTube. I mean, these people are in a horrible position. And uh, I do think they have a responsibility. I just don't think that anyone has yet figured out how they should exercise that responsibility. So when I think about the development of uh, media, I mean, if you go back before 1990, um, I'll forget the exact year, but there were actually laws uh, governing news broadcasts and that news broadcasts had to provide fair sort of balanced uh, reporting on important public issues. That law was changed and then we get cable news, right? Which is, um, sorry, just getting the lights on. Um, yeah, so then you get cable news and now we, you know, we have a platform where people um, can get the information they want. And then the regulation there is simply, look, each of these networks is gonna filter based on what their market will bear. Um, and I do think now we're at a point where there is no filter and how do you start filtering? But the other interesting piece of this, right, is the, um, I mean, I've been reading a fair amount about this, you know, the criticisms that social media companies are getting, you know, daily in exactly cross directions, right? It's your particularly from the Trump administration, you're awful people, you're censoring conservative speech. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, when Twitter didn't, and Facebook didn't do anything in 2016, they were getting all kinds of complaints about uh, just their inaction on such an important issue. Uh, so here's the question. If you are Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube, um, who watches and decides and then we're in a real problem because who watches the watchers and who watches the watchers watching the watchers? Uh, it, it almost, it, it doesn't seem like there is a, that I could think of an administrative or bureaucratic way to govern that. Uh, the very nature of our society is we don't, well, sorry, this is not articulate, but it's a good question. Now you've got me thinking about too many other things. Um, notably, 
it's connected to the fact that if you listen to the Trump administration in particular, um, its figures are constantly denigrating professionals and experts. Uh, whether those are scientists or whether those are the very agencies that they lead. Uh, and so if we, or, or even if you think about the way that uh, some conservatives are constantly complaining about, you know, universities are all liberal uh, bastions, they're brainwashing people, you can't trust someone with a PhD. Um, we have basically been destroying public trust in the authorities that used to tell us what was and wasn't true. Uh, so in some ways, we've gotten what we wanted. We're on our own. Um, it's a lonely place. Well, I can certainly speak for myself that you've given me a lot to think about. And I, I imagine, there imagine there may be a few maybe people, a few people nodding, nodding behind their, behind their, their screens, screens at this point in time. Um, I would invite people to look. There's some commentary in the chat. You may want to look at that. I'm going to draw this uh, seminar to a close, but I'll keep the, uh, the meeting open for another five minutes if uh, people want to uh, take a look it back over the chat or add something to something the chat. To the chat. Um, so um, thank you very much, Jamie, for both for all the work thanks. that has gone into you coming to this point of, of being able to talk to us and for your uh, careful reflection as we asked a number of questions. All right. Well, thanks so much. And thanks everyone for coming.